Hey everyone, today we're diving into the ancient story of Joseph from the Bible's book of Genesis. Joseph is a key figure not only in the Bible but also in the Quran. He was the first son of Jacob and Rachel, making him Jacob's eleventh son overall. Joseph is particularly special because he's the founder of one of the twelve tribes of Israel, the tribe of Joseph. Now, Joseph's story is really important because it explains how the Israelites ended up living in Egypt. He was Jacob's favorite son, which made his brothers incredibly jealous. Their jealousy led them to sell Joseph into slavery in Egypt. Quite the twist, right? But that's just the beginning. While in Egypt, Joseph's life took several dramatic turns. Despite being sold into slavery and later imprisoned, he rose to become the second most powerful person in Egypt. This happened after he successfully interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, predicting seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of famine. Thanks to his foresight, Joseph saved Egypt from famine and was hailed as a hero. Joseph's family, suffering from the famine back home, came to Egypt seeking food. And it was through Joseph's influence that they were allowed to settle in the land of Goshen. Historians have different views on the historical background of Joseph's story. Some, like Thomas Rumor, believe the original narrative might date back to the late Persian period, with later editions fitting into a Greek, Ptolemaic context. In Jewish tradition, Joseph is also seen as the ancestor of a future messiah, called Mashiach ben Yosef. This messiah is believed to fight against evil alongside another messiah, Mashiach ben David, and will ultimately sacrifice himself in this battle. The name Joseph has interesting meanings too. The Bible offers two explanations. It's linked to the Hebrew word for, to gather, remove, take away, and also, to add. This reflects the dual aspects of his story, being taken away from his family and later adding to their numbers and safety. Joseph's journey begins with his family in Canaan. He had ten half-brothers, one full brother, and at least one half-sister. Jacob loved Joseph the most and even gave him a special coat of many colors. When Joseph was seventeen, he had two dreams that suggested his future dominance over his family. Understandably, these dreams didn't sit well with his brothers, leading them to plot against him. They initially planned to kill him but eventually sold him to a passing caravan instead. To cover their tracks, they dipped his special coat in goat's blood and told Jacob that Joseph had been killed. In Egypt, Joseph was sold to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. Despite the tough circumstances, Joseph excelled and became the head of Potiphar's household. However, Potiphar's wife falsely accused him of attempting to assault her, leading to Joseph's imprisonment. Even in prison, Joseph's ability to interpret dreams didn't go unnoticed. He interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker, predicting the cupbearer's restoration to his position and the baker's execution. Joseph asked the cupbearer to mention him to Pharaoh, but this request was forgotten. Two years later, Pharaoh had troubling dreams that none of his advisors could interpret. The cupbearer finally remembered Joseph, who was then brought before Pharaoh. Joseph explained that the dreams foretold seven years of plenty followed by seven years of severe famine, advising Pharaoh to store surplus grain during the good years. And Joseph's story took another incredible turn when he became the vizier of Egypt under the name Zaphnith Pania. Pharaoh honored him by giving him Asenath, the daughter of Petiphera, priest of On, as his wife. During the seven years of abundance, Joseph diligently managed the storage of surplus grain, filling the storehouses to capacity. In the sixth year, Asenath bore him two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When the predicted famine struck, it was so severe that people from surrounding nations came to Egypt to buy food. They were directed to Joseph, who was now in charge of all the grain. The famine became so intense that the Egyptians, excluding the priestly class, eventually sold their land and themselves to Pharaoh in exchange for food. Joseph then established a policy that required a fifth of their produce to go to Pharaoh, a system that lasted until the days of Moses. In the second year of the famine, 
Joseph's half-brothers traveled to Egypt to buy grain. They didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. Keeping his identity a secret, he accused them of being spies. To prove their honesty, they mentioned their youngest brother, Benjamin, who was still in Canaan. Joseph demanded that they bring Benjamin to Egypt. He then imprisoned them for three days before releasing them, holding Simeon as a hostage until they returned with Benjamin. He secretly returned their money in their grain sacks before sending them back to Canaan. When they returned home, they told Jacob everything that had happened, including the demand to bring Benjamin to Egypt. Jacob was distressed, fearing he would lose another son. However, after consuming all the grain, Jacob reluctantly agreed to let Benjamin go, persuaded by Reuben and Judah. Upon their return to Egypt, the brothers were brought to Joseph's house. They were anxious about the money in their sacks, fearing it would be used against them. However, Joseph's steward reassured them and reunited them with Simeon. When Joseph saw Benjamin, he was deeply moved but kept his emotions in check. He hosted a meal for them, though Egyptians and Hebrews ate separately. Before they left, Joseph instructed his steward to secretly place his silver cup in Benjamin's sack. The next morning, the brothers set out for home, but Joseph's steward soon caught up with them, accusing them of stealing the cup. When the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, they were brought back to Joseph. He declared that Benjamin would become his slave, but Judah pleaded passionately, offering himself in Benjamin's place to spare their father further grief. Overwhelmed with emotion, Joseph finally revealed his true identity to his brothers. He wept openly, explaining that although they had intended harm, God had used their actions for good. He urged them to bring their father and their entire family to Egypt, promising them land in Goshen to survive the remaining years of famine. Joseph provided them with Egyptian wagons, new garments, silver, and provisions for their journey. When Jacob, also known as Israel, and his family reached Egypt, Joseph went out in his chariot to meet his father. After more than 20 years apart, their reunion was emotional and joyous. Jacob, deeply moved, expressed his readiness to die now that he had seen Joseph alive. Joseph's family was then introduced to Pharaoh, who welcomed them warmly and offered them prime land in Goshen. He even suggested that any skilled men among them be put in charge of Pharaoh's livestock. Because of Joseph's esteemed position, Pharaoh honored his family, and Jacob was able to bless Pharaoh. Thus, Joseph's family settled in Goshen, ensuring their survival and prosperity during the years of famine. And the house of Israel thrived and multiplied in Egypt for seventeen years, even amidst the harsh famine. By this time, Joseph's father, Jacob, also known as Israel, was 147 years old, bedridden, and had lost most of his vision. Knowing his time was near, Jacob called for Joseph and made him promise to bury him not in Egypt, but in Canaan with his ancestors. Joseph swore to fulfill his father's last wish. Later, Joseph visited his ailing father, bringing his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, with him. Jacob declared that these grandsons would be considered as his own sons, equal to Reuben and Simeon, in the inheritance of the house of Israel. Despite Joseph's initial objection, Jacob crossed his hands, placing his right hand on the younger Ephraim's head and his left on Manasseh's, declaring that Ephraim would surpass his older brother. Jacob then blessed Joseph and gave him a portion of land in Canaan, which he had won from the Amorites. Jacob summoned all his sons to give them his final blessings and prophecies. To Joseph, he bestowed a special blessing, recognizing the trials he had faced and the strength he had shown through God's guidance. After these blessings, Jacob passed away. The family, along with the Egyptians, mourned him for seventy days. Joseph had his father embalmed, which took forty days, and then organized a grand procession to carry Jacob's body to Canaan. They stopped at Atad, where they observed seven days of intense mourning, catching the attention of the local Canaanites. Finally, Jacob was buried in the cave of Machpelah, the burial site Abraham had purchased.
After Jacob's death, Joseph's brothers feared he might seek revenge for their past betrayal. But Joseph reassured them, weeping and explaining that their actions had been part of God's plan to save many lives. He comforted them, and their relationship was healed. Joseph lived to the age of 110, witnessing his great-grandchildren grow. Before his death, he made the children of Israel swear to take his bones with them when they eventually left Egypt. His body was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. Centuries later, during the Exodus, Moses fulfilled this oath, taking Joseph's bones to be buried at Shechem in the land allocated to the tribe of Ephraim. And in Jewish tradition, the sale of Joseph by his brothers was seen as part of God's divine plan to position Joseph in Egypt, where he would eventually save his family from famine. The favoritism Jacob showed Joseph and his brothers plot against him were viewed as instruments of this divine scheme. Maimonides even suggested that the villager Joseph asked about his brother's whereabouts was a divine messenger working behind the scenes. A midrash explores how many times Joseph was sold, revealing five different Hebrew terms describing various groups involved in the transaction. According to Rabbi Judah, Joseph was sold four times, first by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, then by the Ishmaelites to Midianite traders, then by the Midianites to the Medanites, and finally by the Medanites to the Egyptians. Rav Huna added a fifth sale, claiming the Egyptians sold Joseph to Potiphar. Joseph resisted Potiphar's wife for several reasons, loyalty to his master, belief in the sanctity of marriage, and adherence to the ethical and moral principles taught by his father. The Midrash notes that Joseph would have been executed immediately if not for Potiphar's belief in his innocence, given his wife's history of false accusations. Jewish tradition also recounts that Joseph used a silver cup for divination, a practice reflected in the story where his steward plants the cup in Benjamin's sack. This was a test to see if his brothers had changed since they betrayed him years ago. One Talmudic story narrates that Joseph was buried in the Nile River due to a dispute over his tomb's location. Moses, guided by an ancient holy woman named Serach, miraculously retrieved Joseph's sarcophagus during the Exodus. In Christian tradition, Joseph is seen as a figure of faith and a typological precursor to Christ. Early church fathers like John Chrysostom and Ambrose of Milan drew parallels between Joseph's life and the life of Jesus. For instance, Joseph's suffering and eventual rise to power prefigured Christ's resurrection. This typological view persisted through late antiquity, the medieval era, and into the Reformation. Islamic tradition regards Joseph, Yusuf, as a prophet with his story being the only complete narrative of a person in the Quran. The Quran portrays Joseph as extraordinarily handsome, leading to Potiphar's wife attempting to seduce him. The story aligns closely with the biblical account, with some variations, such as the brothers' plea to take Joseph with them, and the detail that Jacob cried so much he lost his eyesight. The story culminates in Joseph revealing his identity to his brothers and forgiving them and his family eventually prostrating before him, fulfilling his earlier dream. Baha'i writings frequently reference Joseph, drawing metaphors from his story. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, uses the fragrance of Joseph's garment as a metaphor for the recognition of God's manifestations.